Hello, everyone. My name is Sun. I am a marketer. I own a digital agency in New York called Night Owls, where we help personal brands with their website, with their marketing and branding. I also run a community called Night Owl, <coughs> Night Owl Nation, where we practice storytelling together and I teach storytelling, which is starting this week, by the way, or this this weekend, our first week. So if you want to learn storytelling or you want to practice storytelling, make sure you join Night Owl Nation. I'll put the link in the, uh, in the description. Okay, so in this podcast, I help some of our Night Owl Nation members with their storytelling, and their personal branding, or their marketing. We have today Ray. Hello, Ray. Hi, Sun. Hey, Ray. Okay, so can you kind of introduce yourself first and then um, tell us where you're from, and what, what do you do for work? What, or what did you do for work? And then we can go into your questions. Sure. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much for having me on your podcast, son. My name is Ray. I am a visual storyteller and was an educator for about 15, a little more than 15 years. And I was, I did a lot of different things in the meantime when, and also simultaneously uh, so I was also a graphic designer, I was a photographer, and I was also a filmmaker. And um, <clears throat> can you go into kind of your story or what do you, um, what do you need help with? Or you have a yeah. Question yeah. Okay. So I'm here on your podcast because I know that you turn people – uh, people's stories into amazing personal brands. And I'm in a interesting situation. Um, at, during Night Owl Nation, you gave us an assignment uh, to sort of um, find a weakness of ours that was also a strength at different times in our lives. And this assignment kind of coincided with the story that I've been trying to write uh, for a really long time um, about a revelation in my life where I learned uh, certain things about how my brain works differently than other people, than my peers. And um, so I was hoping that you could listen to uh, part of that story. It's not really finished, but I was hoping you could help me sort of either replace some of those five second moments with better ones or pull in different parts or what you would eliminate um, that could potentially make it a better story that would uh, make a better personal brand. I'm not sure if that question makes sense. Sure. Well, let's hear the story first. And then afterwards, I, I want to also hear kind of, I guess, what your pitch is for your audience. Like, you know, what, what, is, it, what is it they're going to get from you as well? Yeah. So maybe okay. it'll make more sense once I hear the story. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if I have a pitch for you. That's the other question that I have. Uh, but I'll tell them my story first um, so you have a little bit yeah. of context. Okay. All right, audience, this is an eight-minute story. It's still not finished, but uh, please bear with me. Okay. So in the second grade, my teachers called me and my mother in for a parent-teacher conference. But because it didn't happen during the parent-teacher conference week, I was really anxious. Like, what had I done wrong? Was I being kicked out of school? Was I failing second grade? I didn't know. Uh, while looking down at their evaluation of me, my teacher started explaining to my mother that I was slower than my peers, that I couldn't solve problems on my own, that I ranked far below my peers on just about every academic standard, like math, reading, writing. My mother needed to see this with her own eyes. When she came home one day, I was sitting with my grandfather. He would combine a random number of azuki beans 
and ask how many there were. And when I fail to count them correctly every single time, my grandfather exchanged very concerned looks with my mother. Not even a full week after this moment, I was enrolled into an after-school tutoring program. Over the next years and months, I spent hours completing worksheets full of equations or reading really dry texts and answering multiple choice questions. My marks in school improved a little bit, but in my brain, nothing changed. I still couldn't think critically or articulate my real opinions or present my thoughts in a way that other people could understand them. When I opened my mouth, my brain would explode into millions of directions at the same time. I would see images and patterns, video clips would play, but I couldn't transcribe them into words fast enough before I lost connection, both internally to my visual sources and externally to the average person's attention span. A couple of years ago, when I became pregnant with my daughter, something in my brain changed. All of a sudden, my mind felt really quiet. I could think very logically and sequence my thoughts while I was speaking. For the first time in my life, I actually sounded normal. I even sounded smart. Uh, doctors say that during pregnancy, a woman loses a lot of the gray matter in her brain, which is um, kind of correlated to creativity in some ways. And I really loved this update to my operating system because I finally felt like I wasn't stupid or slow. I finally felt like I was communicating my true thoughts with the outside world. Then about 16 months postpartum, my brain started exploding in multiple directions again. And I started researching everything I could about why my brain works so differently than everyone else's why I struggled to form coherent sentences, why my words could never satisfy the pictures that I saw. And in this research, I came across the word neurodivergent. And just by looking at the word, I could tell that it was going to explain everything I had ever felt was wrong with me. As I started reading about this umbrella term, which included things like ADHD or dyslexia, dyscalculia. There was one category of neurodivergence from which I could identify with every single symptom, which was a less commonly understood form of autism. When my therapist asked if I wanted an official evaluation, my inner child transported back to that parent-teacher conference in the second grade, because ever since that moment, my intelligence had been tested, was compared, then ranked against my peers, told repeatedly that I was inferior on every metric that society valued. And now I was being asked if I wanted to be evaluated, but this time, at the risk of being excluded from the only group of people who actually thought and communicated like me. In this moment, my life finally made sense because all the tears I couldn't shed before, I, before started to actually flow. I was tired of seeking society's validation society's categorization of where I belong and where I do not, society's definition of who is valued and who is not. And I never want any child who thinks in images, recalls their memories in cinematic montages, and sequences their thoughts 
like topographical maps to ever go to a school that tells them that they have to change who they are to be accepted ever again. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your story. <laughs> so I, I actually came across that word recently. And the, the reason how I came across that word is actually through TikTok. Because uh, for, for me, it was actually a um, different reason. I started seeing all these videos on TikTok and YouTube about ADHD and autism, right? And you know those those videos where people come out and be like, "Oh, twelve reasons you didn't know you you had autism," or you know, like six six things people don't know about know about ADHD or whatever it is, right? And I was like, "Why are there so many people that have autism and ADHD? Like, what, what, what like, what, or is it like just because of TikTok, all these people are just appearing, or what's going on?" So I started kind of like researching that word. So, can I first ask you? How do how did you find that out? Like, was it just through research? Was it self-diagnosed, or did you go see a psychiatrist, psychologist, or something? Yeah. Uh, okay. So there have been several times in my life, um, and I've been trying to. There are lots of moments in my life where um, this this idea of autism crossed my path. Um, and the first time I remember, um, I don't remember this and I can't rem it's really hard because my mother doesn't remember this happening. And I don't, I've lost contact with a lot of people who might be able to confirm this. But when I was very young, I remember doing a series of like tests like Rorschach tests and, um, like visual sequencing, visual reasoning kind of skills. And the only reason I thought of that was because um, for about three years in 2013 uh, to 2016, I taught the gifted and talented program at an elementary school. And uh, I remember when I was um, administering that test one, one year, I remember looking through the booklets and going, why does this look so familiar? And I remember um, like being in a certain room with like really colorful images and not really colorful images, but like lots of things on the walls and being and talking to somebody, looking at images. And I remember going into a different room to uh, sequence certain things. And um, I remember asking my mother about this uh, in 2013 or 2014, if she remembered me taking this kind of test. And uh, she was like, why are you asking this? Like as if she had something to hide. And so that kind of made me really anxious because I'm actually a very anxious person, very neurotic. And so she... Um, and so eventually she said something like, um, you know, when you took these tests, your teachers told me that you were special. But when they asked if we wanted to put you in a different classroom, um, separate from your peers, I told them no. And, um, so I taught the gifted and talented program and they are on a different continuum than the people who go into special education. And so I'm pretty sure that I wasn't special in the sense that I was gifted and talented, but that I was special in that I probably could have benefited from being in special education. So that was my earliest memory. Um, and I couldn't get any more information. How do you know that? How do you know that? you would have benefited from uh, like being in a special program. Okay. Versus. Yeah. Uh, so I am very slow to understand things. And I was researching, um, you know, neurodivergence in this particular category 
of autism. And there's a difference between top-down processing and information processing and bottom-up processing. And uh, neurotypical people generally are able to, okay, this is still harder for me to explain. So let me explain how bottom-up information processors work. Um, so I, okay, so bottom-up processors, what they do is they conclude certain ideas or concepts or hypotheses after um, looking at a lot of different data, um, not necessarily like statistics and numbers kind of data, but just like visual data, this data, lots of different um, things. And then they come to a conclusion. So they start with details first, and then they kind of go big picture um, and are able to uh, understand what they've collected based on what they've collected. And it's... Um, and uh, the top, the top-down processors are kind of the opposite. Um, and I think both, pe like everybody, uses bottom-up processing and top-down processing for um, different tasks. Um, but the top-down processing is really difficult for me uh, when it comes to many different, many different topics. And so um, it by design. I just, I can't understand um, topics that I don't have a lot of prerequisite understanding in. It just takes me so long to understand it. Um, and also there's another part. I don't think that's, <laughs> okay. Cause I, when you say that, that sounds like me. So, cause I'm like that, right? So for example, you know, when we design a website or something like that, we're taught to start with the, you know, the goal of the website and you figure, and then you break down the pages and you, you figure out the goal of each page. And there's a whole process where you have to, or even when you, let's say you build a house, right? Like you have to start with the foundation and you have to, you know, you got you have to figure out a floor plan, blah, blah, blah. And then finally comes like the last detail, right? Where the doorknob's going to go, where the, all the, the tiny little details, right? Like I, I do, I work the other way also, right? I start with the, the details first and then but i you know you can't obviously you know you can't do stuff like that and, and i can't build a website by designing a button first and then and then build my way back right because that then the website's not going to make any sense like yeah. i have to start with the goal and then i have to narrow down so and also like like you said like when when i'm learning um when i'm learning i don't think it's because um people understand more of like a, I guess the top bottom up approach, I guess. I don't think that's why people, or top down approach. I don't think it's because people learn better that way. I think it's because when, when somebody learns that way, somebody says, okay, here's the premise. And then here's like the next, next, like, and then finally go into the detail or something like that. I don't, necessarily think it they're it's because they're learning better i think it's because they're just memorizing it and they're not really learning it so they're like okay if somebody says okay here's the here's the website and we're gonna have these pages and blah, 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 and then they narrow it down and you know finally got, get to the details i think what they're doing is they're just assuming that that is that is the foundation even though for me like the problem is when somebody says, okay, just here, here's the, here's the basic information about this topic. And then now I'm going to talk about this specifically in this thing. I'm like, no, you, the reason why that doesn't work for me is because you just want me to assume that those, that's the basic foundation. How do I really, I, I don't, I don't trust you. <laughs> well, exactly. how do I really know that that's the, so it's, but other people are the same way. I think the only difference is they're just taking the word, their word for it that that's the basic foundation, versus I'm just not I'm not willing to take their word for it. I I need to understand every little detail myself first. Yes. Just you know how like, have you heard of Bloom's taxonomy? Yes. So you know how like the first level is just memorization, and the second level is comprehension, right? 
Yes. I think that most people are just okay with moving on with uh, moving on with memorization and before they get to that second step. Like I'm for me, I'm not okay with that. If somebody explains something, and that's why I think when when somebody watches a movie, right, and uh, like a science movie, and somebody goes like, oh, "Okay," for and they they just blur out some scientific <laughs> words, and they're like, "Oh, that's the reason why we you know we we couldn't go to Mars or whatever." I'm sorry, like, like I I have to like stop them. I'm like, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense, and then I have to like actually argue with them, break it down, right? And so when when I see something like that in the movie, I can't move further. Like I can't keep watching that movie. Because this part didn't make sense to me. <laughs> Do you yes. know what I mean? Yeah. But I, I don't know if that's because we think differently. I think it's because there some people are okay with just assuming certain things and then moving on, whereas in maybe like we're not. Do you understand what I mean? I do. <laughs> but anyway, maybe I have autism. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Let's continue. <laughs> well, um, okay. So, like, I have many different moments from my life, mm. not just that one, um, but like the, more recently, like, you know, when I had this realization, I went to my therapist who I've, um, this particular therapist I've been seeing for three years. And um, I was telling her about all of my findings and uh, we started talking about it and she sort of calmed me down. And uh, when I sort of presented all of my findings and my reasoning for why I'm pretty sure that I'm on the spectrum, she kind of listened to me and I'm not sure like exactly her motivations Um but she sort of like accepted my findings and like left it at that. And I told her um, that, so I know several people who work with autistic clients. So one of my really good friends who's known me for almost 15 years. Like a uh, therapist or a psychi psychiatrist? She's a special education teacher. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so I, um, I asked her sort of, um, I kind of like went to her and I was like, Hey, I think I'm autistic. Um, can you, can you like talk to me? And so we started talking and I asked her, do you think I'm autistic? And, um, she actually didn't respond for a couple of days. Um, and then she kind of, she got back to me and she said, uh, she said a variety of things um, and she kind of like, and then when I read her long message, she was like, yes, Ray, I do think you're autistic. And I was just like, oh my gosh. And I just had so much relief because. Did you ever um, get it, get, you, get it diagnosed though? So because like, if I understand correctly, autism is not. Like I think people think that when you say you're on the spectrum, that it's like this, this scale of like you, you're more autistic or less autistic, like that. Right. But I actually think there are different traits within it, and you have to check every single box, yeah, to be diagnosed as aut diagnosed for autism, right? Yeah. So do you check every box? <laughs> so, um, so my number one reasoning for why I do not want to receive an official, official diagnosis, aside from the fact that it is very expensive and that I can't find um, an English speaking. Uh, it's not like um, covered by insurance. No, it's not. And it's not, it's <laughs> not something it's not. And it's also, I can't find an English speaking um, administrator of this mm -hmm. test in South Korea where I currently reside. Um, and also it's also, it takes a lot of time. I'm a full-time mom. I don't have time for that. But my primary reason for why I don't want an official diagnosis is the tests were written at a time when they had very little research on what autism was. And it's written by a lot of, um, 
dominant culture people who from like the 60s um, who come from a perspective of wanting to fix somebody because they think that autism is a disease. And um, so they're very pathologizing. And my therapist is very against pathologizing. So she never tells me, oh, Ray, I think you have this disease or this issue, or she never tells me labels. Um, we just kind of talk about what I'm struggling with. And then we kind of come up with strategies and tools and techniques to cope with them, cope with the issues mm -hmm. that I have. And um, from my understanding, uh, the way that the di they diagnose autism is very pathologizing. And because I'm high functioning, um, the way and also because I'm a female, lots or maybe of, you don't have autism. Yes, it's it is that could be true too. It right? could but, be but true. Here's the reason why I say that. Mm -hmm. so I'm not trying to like dismiss anything you say, but when I watch those TikTok videos, like first of all, almost all of them are self diagnosed. Mm -hmm. And every time I watch those videos, I'm like, oh, yeah, I do that. Oh, I, I, I have that. Like it doesn't, it just, and it, it almost seems like a tr something that a lot of people would do. It's not something that, oh, uh, you do that because you're autistic or you do this because you have ADHD. Because like, I saw right. the similar things in ADHD too. Like, I'm like, oh, I'm like that. Oh, yeah, I can't focus. Oh, yeah, when I read a book, I, can't, I have to read the book same, same page three times. Like, oh, I do that. Like, but then when I talk to other people, like a lot of people actually do that. Do yeah. you understand what I mean? Right. So I almost feel like... Here, here's where I like I, I I guess I didn't really look into it long enough, like maybe like you to know it, but like where I kind of you know the conclusion that I drew is like it's either that these people don't have autism or ADHD, they're just normal people with a certain certain personality traits that are you know different, obviously, like just but every every human being is different, right? Or sure. Maybe this is a normal thing. Maybe maybe it's not a medical condition. Maybe it's just something. Maybe it's just another personality trait, or maybe it's just like, like just like uh, people who are introverts versus extroverts, or people who are you know, like uh, people who are more conscientious versus creative. Like there there are different you know personality of people. Maybe it's like one of those or something like that. Mm -hmm. I mean that's. That's kind of what I thought. What do you think about that? Hmm. Well, I think, um, well, first of all, I don't know TikTok. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not on it. Um, mm -hmm. I don't watch any videos from TikTok. From, but from what I understand, it's, it's, a, it's a very short video clip platform. And I'm not sure... Um, if the people that you are looking at who talk about autism have um, are talking about anything, most of them are not talking credible. about. It. <laughs> what they do yeah. is, you know how, like on Instagram Reels, they have those videos where they they have these words on the screen and they like point at things or they're like tick, 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 like they point at these. Oh words. yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen uh, those. It's it's basically like those. Yeah. But so they don't actually say anything. Okay. The, the whole video. It's just music. And on the top, it'll say, like, uh, six signs that you might have autism. Oh, I see. You know what I mean? And then there's, yeah. like, and then they point at these words, right? Or six, like, five, five, five things that only ADD, people with ADHD know, right? <laughs> and, sure. you know, they'll, they'll point it out. But it, they, it, most of them seem like, it could be something that you can just use as an excuse to, you know, <laughs> say, oh, that, oh, that's why I suck in school. Or that's mm -hmm. why I, you know what I mean? Something like that. Yeah. And um, so it's interesting that you bring this up. And I'm wondering if, mm -hmm. if you think that I'm using it as an excuse. Well, not an excuse, but... I, because I also see people do this, right? Like, oh, uh, like, no, I'm just not that kind of. I'm, I'm. Just, I also see people like, oh, I no, I can't do sales. That's just not. I just can't do that. That's not me, right? Or something right. like that. But mm -hmm. 
but you know like have you ever heard that quote that say like whether you think you can or you can't you're 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 right yes <laughs> right? and I, I i strongly believe that you know whatever you you believe you're gonna manifest it I, i'm i'm now using the word manifest in a wood woo way like i i believe that uh it's, it's gonna be a self-fulfilled prophecy is what i'm saying so here's an example growing up i've never my parents never bought me the, anything that I, I actually wanted, right? Like, you know how, like, some kids get surprised, like, they're like surprise! And then he was like, the, like that, has, that has never, ever once happened to me, right? There was, yeah. like, for example, uh, on Christmas, I really wanted this, uh, like, I, I really wanted, like, a video game console. But I ended up getting, a, you know, those recorder, like, yeah. you know, those plastic recorder, like, which is, like, $10 or whatever. And and a and a teddy bear, right? I'm like, what the fuck? Like like I was always let down in those kind of like that happened that Christmas. And another time, like I um my parents said that they're like after like a year, they're gonna buy me a bicycle finally. And there was this like BMX bike back then that was like really, really popular. Like it was all the cool kids had it. And it was like a three hundred dollar bike, and I thought I was gonna get that one. But then um uh, like my parents ended up buying me this like mountain bike that was like for adults and that was like <laughs> that old man rides right and I was like <sighs> so I've never ever ever gotten what I wanted right and I've never won anything I've never felt like I you know I got a surprise gift or anything like that right and like so throughout my life what ended up happening is like I started telling myself I'm just not. I'm not the type of person that wins stuff. I'm not like I'm not this I'm not the type of person that gets into good schools. I'm not the type of person that like whatever I want and I really really desire, I'm not going to get it. Mm. And I literally lived my entire life like that. And I think that actually had a lot to do with like I think I actually like um like self-fulfilled that those prophecies. By not trying harder, or like not even trying to do this, or not even trying to enter a contest or whatever it is, right? Oh my god, yeah. that's just never gonna happen, or something like that. So I, I'm not a big fan of like labeling myself or yeah. like people who who label themselves or something like that. You know what I mean? Because yeah. it might not be true. <laughs> you know? Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and I think that I don't think I'm trying to use it as a label to sort of identify, like, I don't want that to be my identity, um, necessarily. I, I don't want people to, I mean, there are a lot of, uh, there are several people who are very openly and make their life's work about autism. I, I don't, that's not what Have I... Have you seen, um influencers that i'm talking about though like maybe not on tiktok because they're all over the place they're on instagram and they're on youtube also i, so, I want to, and they're mostly like kids they're usually either like teenagers or college kids or like they're never like older people they're always mm -hmm. like people in their 20s or like teens i i, I think, think I, I think you should look at them like you should really look at them and then evaluate like what what your opinion is of what's going on there because it is a phenomenon <laughs> that, yeah you know. yeah i i do know that um somebody recently i think a musician sia i think she recently came out uh to the public and told everyone that she was diagnosed with autism um so i know that it is a trending topic um right now uh, and so I'm not sure if I should be thankful that this is something that this is um, trending so that there is more research and more opinions uh, emerging, or if it's kind of like a double-edged sword. Like if I had told this story like 10 years ago, right, um, would, would I? Or like 20 years ago. Right. Let, let me ask you this. Like. 20 years ago, I have, people had a, a completely different uh, idea of autism, right? Right. Like, for example, if you say I'm autistic, like they almost like um, correlate it with like Down syndrome or some sort of 
like sure. you know like retardation or whatever it is right yeah and then now it's com- it's almost like change it, it's um, the way people look at the word is co- totally different now yeah so what do you think about that is it that it's changed or is it that people were just ignorant back then or you know well i think it's both um and i think there's a lot of influence um i think social interactions have a lot of influence and i think because there have been a lot of i guess positive associations in the media surrounding autism um i know like i don't know maybe it's been 20 years but there was um there are several korean films and dramas um that kind of had autistic characters and um i know that the first one i thought i think it was called marathon um and that kid had um uh, a version of autism i think it's called savant syndrome and um uh so that oh, yeah. became like uh like rain man right i don't know rain man <laughs> oh you don't know rain man like no. the movie with uh tom cruise and what's his name no, I didn't see. Or, it. yeah, so like those. So, but you know, like that's that's how I used to think of autism, right? Like people who have autism, it's very obvious that you can see it yeah. with your eyes, like like that person has autism or something like that. Whereas in now, it's it's almost like supposed to be a hidden thing that you don't even know this person has autism, right? Right. Like, what do you think happened there, or is that is it just like a different level of autism, or is it that? Those people actually check all of those boxes where to a point where it it interferes with their life versus, do you understand what I mean? Yeah. So earlier you mentioned um, that most people think of the spectrum as very little or you have it or you don't or very little and then you have a lot or um, maximum. Right. But that's not what spectrum is at all, right? Um, And so uh, the way that um, spectrum is being discussed, I guess, in research right now is that it's more like how we think of the multiple intelligences theory, where it's like there are varying types of neurodivergence within the spectrum and um, you present differently based on combinations of what type of neurodivergence uh, qualities that um, make up your brain. And um, so I know Temple Grandin, she uh, she talks a lot about autism and she's written many, many books on this. Um, and she talks about how she's high functioning, but that the type of autism she has is very visual. Um, and there's another kind, which is patterns or I wonder if they're the same thing. Well, there are three um, prominent types that she talks about. Um, And so I think I am very interested in learning more about these things because um, there are, there's so much that we don't know about the spectrum. And um, there are things that we do know, but those aren't, things that are really well known by the majority of people yet. Um, And every time a film comes out, they only focus on one type of autism. And so everybody thinks, oh, it's clear if somebody is autistic or not. Um, But also like the way that I see it, I think autism um, spectrum disorder, that's what it's called. um, I don't think it's gonna be called that uh, years from now. Um, because I think that when we know more about it, um, we're going to see that uh, everybody has some sort of differences in their brain that makes them more skilled at certain things than other people. And so like right now, it's still something that is either still tabooed or just not known about. But I think in the future, when there's a lot more research and a lot more uh, representation, yeah, that it's going to... Like I heard something like either 80% or 90% or some crazy high number like that Mm -hmm. of engineers at Google have autism. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. 
<laughs> so obviously it's not like okay <laughs> if that is the case it's not they're they're not like it's not like there's something wrong with them right if there's something wrong no, with yeah. them they wouldn't be building <laughs> the products that we use every day right so and that's exactly what i want to say um well yeah but that's 100 percent true i think that um we as a society sort of favor certain um, skill sets um, and uh, not favor some other ones. And I think my entire life I've felt very stifled and suffocated because what I'm good at was never valued by society. And so, um, you know, I'm I guess for yours yes. is what you had is probably different than what those engineers had because those engineers are actually really good in class. Like they, they're they they're good in like uh, math class, like certain classes, right? Like analytical classes, like math, science, like certain types of science, physics, things like that. They're just probably bad in certain other classes. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, but anyway, so what do you think? So first, first of all, I really think you should look into to those uh, TikTok videos and that, the cultural phenomenon part of this, right? Where people have people have popularized it and almost like to a point where glor they're glorifying it mm. because when I when I look at those pe people on TikTok, especially the younger ones, I start to wonder in my head: uh, is is that actually hurting them? Like the the fact that they're coming out and doing this, like, oh, this reasons why, and, and they're just so infatuated with them, like, I almost think, it almost makes me believe, like, is is it counterproductive for them, right? Mm. Because they're they're constantly creating this identity for themselves as something else, and then by glorifying it on TikTok and things like these people have millions of followers, are they also misdiagnosing other like uh, are mm. is it creating more people out there of people just misdiagnosing themselves <laughs> or something mm. like that and therefore putting on this label on themselves and like i think cuz i was starting to think that this is kind of hurting people like society like culturally do you know mm. that, do you understand what i mean oh in what ways and like if you see the those tiktok videos i think you'll know what i mean because <laughs> oh, okay. there, there's li literally like millions of kids on TikTok who are using these, like, and and just like I watch them because I wonder how many of them are really genuinely, um, you know, have this versus how many of them are just following on the trend just because they want more followers. Mm. Do you understand what I mean? Because it is a trend, and it is something that it is something that gets you followers and views. Do you know what I mean? So it's it's kind of like um I think of this I I think of it same way as like when I look at like uh uh astrology or even like human design or like even like the Myers Briggs test and all of that like there are people that take this way too far right they make mm -hmm. and and like you know there are YouTube channels like that just talk about oh like you know, like things that INTJs do, blah, blah, blah. like I know they they make whole vi YouTube videos about it, and I'm like, I I honestly don't think that's actually really helping anybody because we took something that's serious, yes, that we should take it seriously, and we almost like turned it into a joke. We like almost turned it into like, like it's kind of like what what horoscope did, right? They 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 turned it into this fun little thing that you do on the newspaper, right? To, to you know, so and and I I really don't know if it is helping people, but anyway, I mean, so first I think you should really really look into the the cultural side of this because mm -hmm. and and then I think you have to think about if you want to build a personal brand. And you are you feel strongly about this? Like, what is the what is the thing that you feel strongly about, mm. and what is your opinion? Meaning, okay, what do you think the world is doing wrong? Yeah, really, and be specific about it, right? Where, mm. in what country, what in in what classroom, what specifically, and then what needs to be done about it? Something like that. Yeah. 
Right. And okay, so I realize that we've been talking about autism, but that's not actually my focus at all. <laughs> um, yeah. oh, okay. I think I was, I think, <laughs> yeah, I think you asked me, um, and I kind of understand how we got off track. And I think it's because you asked me uh, if I was sure that I um, was on the spectrum. And um, so actually, this is the reason that clicked for me, that made me understand why I have been so interested in education my entire life. And um, the reason is because I do think differently than my peers and that I have different skill sets um, than my peers. And uh, this was sort of like, you know, the the big piece that I think helped me realize why I felt different my entire life. But that is my inciting incident. It's not the message that I want to share with the world or create a personal brand around. Um, what I want to create a personal brand around is how we measure success in the education system. Right now we sort of favor um, people who are good at math and uh, verbal reasoning skills. Um, and we also test them on speed and accuracy. But um, Malcolm Gladwell uh, actually talks a lot about this in many of his books and all of his talks. Um, and he, there's one concept that he talks about um, called the capitalization rate, which was popularized or introduced by a psychometrician um, named James Flynn. And uh, the capitalization rate basically is how you measure human potential uh, by asking, are the people who um, are capable of achieving something actually achieving it, right? Um, and so he says that in America, the capitalization rate of students are incredibly low. Um, and he says that there are three factors which constrain um, constrain the capitalization rate. And one is poverty. Um, another one is stupidity, but that actually requires a little bit of explanation. And then the third, um, I forget what the third, oh, culture, culture and attitudes and beliefs. And um, I started a podcast to sort of talk with a lot of people about their own experiences in the education system and what are some things that were challenging for them and what are some things that they excelled in uh, to sort of kind of figure out like a big picture of what the education system is doing right from the perspective of those who went through it as a student. And um, I've just been like, I don't exactly know what is at the end of all this research. I'm just really curious about whether we can increase the capitalization rate or not. Um, and if we can't, or I'm sure we can, but like what is the right way to do that? And I am not like, I'm just one person and I only know what I know. I don't know what I don't know. And so I just wanted to talk with a lot of people uh, experts eventually um and people yeah, who so you need yeah. to so it sounds like you're not trying to actually spread a specific message or something like that or or maybe you are maybe the, there is like something underneath all of this but it sounds more like you're trying to open up the conversations yes or something like that and maybe that is the goal. <laughs> maybe that is the message that you you're spreading that we shouldn't, we should, we should open up conversation about whether our education system is working or not, or something like that. Maybe. Yeah. It's like similar to like. Um, what am I saying? Like, similar to. You know, I, I guess pretty much most podcasts that people talk about, right? Like when 
when they invite in guests and talk about something, it's not because like they're trying to spread a message, but it's they're trying to just learn more about some a, a topic yes. with, that's not talked about or that's taboo or something like that. Right. Yeah. And that's really my question to you is how do you create a brand around a brand that doesn't have a goal <laughs> just um, just to kind of, yeah. I think that is the goal. Hmm. Ha- to know more. Op- talking, like, for example, there are podcasts out there, for example, that talks about sex very openly, mm. right? And their goal is to maybe <laughs> make sex make make talking about sex less taboo and there's like talk pockets that are out there about talking about money right like for example um uh i i see this podcast like it's not dave ramsey but one of those kind of people where he he, he people come, he, he'll have people come on and this people break down their own their their bills their um They'll basically open up their books and tell you how much money they're spending on what, how much money they make, and something, something like that. And he's just going through that and telling them what all everything that they're doing wrong and <laughs> all of that. Like you shouldn't be spending so much money eating out and like. But it's basically like people, we don't talk about money publicly, and it's taboo yeah. to talk about money. But you know, so this guy is just opening up a conversation about th- that that topic, right? Like h- how you should be. Um, just o- opening up a conversation about money or um yeah i i guess i see some people talking about this topic as well right um because it, you do realize that it is changing it's it is like i don't i think it's changing now faster than it's ever before and mm-hmm. though if you because if you think about the current education system it's it's like a 500 year old system yeah right the whole K through 12 and then bachelor's and master's, the PhD, like that whole system. And you do see that it's, it is it is kind of like now there's like charter schools popping up. Like, what do you think about like Montessori schools? Yeah. So I actually went to, uh, so I, I grew up in Los Angeles, California and um, there we have like uh, magnet schools. Um, and um, I went to a charter school that was also a magnet for elementary. Um, and it was, uh, so with federal funding, they did something very differently than other schools. Um, and I really loved my elementary school experience. Um, and I have a daughter now and I'm just like, I don't want to send her through uh, conventional education, but we can't really afford private education. And I am an educator, so maybe I should homeschool, but I also want her to socialize. I'm just in that space of trying to figure out what. And I love Montessori uh, philosophy. Um, And, uh, you know, there's Waldorf, there's um, Emilio, Emilia, Romana, something. Um, there are lots of different techniques, and I like all of them. Um, I just like that they're more student centered. I think anything that's student centered will work best. Yeah, I almost feel like um, that's another thing, right? Like, I think homeschooling is going go, is is becoming more popular than ever right yeah. now, and that probably is rooted to the fact that other people a lot of other people feel the same way you do right Right. like that they don't like (laughs) they don't like the education system and how like how it's been working for the forever so yeah i guess it you know i wouldn't think of it as like you're building a personal brand um but a personal brand is going to come out of it and that's kind of what a personal brand actually is, right? I don't, I don't think of personal branding as like one thing. I always say is like you know, you don't build a brand or a personal brand by sitting in a room with a bunch of experts with a whiteboard that says, okay, you know, you're bold, you're colorful, you're and then coming up with these adjectives that defines who you are, and all, and here's your brand mission. And it's really like you are. Everyone has already built a brand. Yeah. And all their friends know that already. 
whether are you gonna re, are you gonna do it more publicly or not? That's the only difference. Like your brand is how you people who already are close to you perceive you as people who know you, how they perceive you. That's already your brand. Mm. Do you understand what I mean? And for example, like if I were to say, "What's Oprah?" Okay, if I were to say like, "What's Oprah's brand?" What, what would you say? <laughs> Uh, deeply thought-provoking conversations about topics that matter. Okay. And do you think that's how other people see it? See her as a brand? I feel like uh, maybe the words might change, but I think the overall consensus yeah. would probably be similar. Yeah, exactly. So I don't think it's a brand... I don't think a brand is something that like words define. Brand is just a kind of a feeling that you get when you think of this person. Do you understand what I mean? Yeah. So, like, I think you know a brand would, like, and then when I think of like, for example, you know, Doctor Phil, I might have a, a little bit of different feel, right? And then if I think of like, you know, Jim Carrey, then I have mm -hmm. a different feel, right? Like, it's but the, these are just different feelings that we have about that person, right? Or yeah. something like that. So, but it's, that came out of the, just the things that they're doing every day. The only difference between you and them is that they're doing out it in public and you're doing it in private. Do you understand what I mean? Yeah. So that's why I think the podcast is like the, the perfect thing for you to do is because that's ba basically what Oprah does, right? Yeah. She, she doesn't. She doesn't have a message to go out and trying to spread. So all she does is she interviews other people for her own personal curiosity. She's trying to scratch her own itch by trying to find out about this and information. And in doing so, other people are just tuning in and 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 learning the same thing that she's learning, right? Yeah. And I guess that's that's how most of these kind of like interview format shows are there you know like uh ha, do you have you ever heard of lewis house yes the greatest school of greatness yeah so yeah lewis house has a podcast where he's he basically says the reason why he he started that podcast however many years ago is because he wanted to learn this stuff right right he just wanted to talk to people and ask them the questions that he wants to ask and in in doing so, like other people are also hearing the same answers. But I personally think that that's the best way to do a podcast. To invite yeah. a... Go ahead. Oh, to invite a guest and talk to them. Yeah, but ask them the questions that... See, this is where m most people make a mistake. When I see 99% of podcasts out there, they invite this famous guest who's an expert in this thing. They, and they ask him the same exact question that every other podcast asks them. Do you understand what I mean? Right. All the same exact questions. But when I look at the best podcast, the top podcast, the 1% of the podcast, they ask them a really good question that, that that person has never been asked before. Yeah. Or at least not been asked publicly or not some, or they push back a little bit. <laughs> or you know what I mean? It's 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 those conversations that you normally don't hear from that person, and that's what makes a good pot. In my opinion, like that's what I would do. If if I had a podcast where I'm I'm interviewing guests for their area of expertise, I would try to find all the questions that I would like listen to every episode of podcast that that person has been on. So I already know what they're gonna say about almost everything <laughs> about this ninety nine personal topics and i would just focus hone in on that one person of questions that nobody has asked them yeah do, do you understand what i mean yep and yeah. and that's kind of like scratching your because like you, you know how many times i see a podcast that gary v's on Mm. And people are asking him questions, and they're just asking him the same exact. Oh, how do? Oh, so well, what's the best platform right now? Oh, what, how, like how should I make a like the same old boring the the same old questions that he's already answered a thousand times before. I already know what he's gonna say. I know mm. the answer. 
And I'm like, why don't you ask him about this other thing, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, I really want to know this other, uh, his opinion on this other thing or something like, do you know what I mean? Yeah. And almost every podcast I listen to is like that. I'm like, why are you asking them these boring ass questions? Why don't you ask him about this other thing? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I totally understand. And you have an assignment in Night Owl Nation where you ask us to build a podcast. And mm -hmm. um, I think your whole, uh, one of your reasons um, why you should start a podcast is is to go in not knowing anything about your topic. And your whole purpose of starting the podcast is to start with, um, just being curious, being there yeah, to learn. Curiosity. Yeah. yeah. And so I definitely took that to heart and almost literally when I started my podcast, because I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just going to start messy. Um, and so that's where I'm at right now. And on this topic of podcasts, um, there is a piece of feedback um, and I kind of want to tie this back to my story just a little bit before our time is over. But um, there's a there's a piece of feedback that you gave to one of your podcast guests. Um, you told her that uh, her story was really amazing, but what would make it even more impactful is when she shares her story after she became an artist. And I agreed mm -hmm. with your feedback because some stories need several pieces of life that haven't actually happened yet for it to really um, connect um, and I or to really connect with their audience in like a deeply moving way and so my question to you is based on the story that I shared with you today um, what points either lived or not yet lived do you think are missing from my story in order to gain okay um, yeah Let, uh, see that that's a great question <laughs> See, like those are the kind of questions that people don't ask me right mm -hmm. and people always ask me the same old questions over and over and over again and that's i think because anyway but that's a good question and and i i actually think that for me and for most people that i know mo almost every expert like the best questions are going to be the ones that are selfish to the person asking to the asking the question like the thing that they really want to know right but a lot of times they don't want to say it because whether it like you know they're like oh am i the only one that asked this am i the only one who's curious about this or like does this is this gonna piss them off or is this gonna is this too pretentious or for whatever reason they're worried about what the audiences are gonna think of that question more than actually they're scratching their own itch but most likely when you scratch your own itch and ask them the thing that you really want to ask, a lot of times that's the same exact thing that everybody else was curious about too. <laughs> right? Like like right. when I'm in a room and I, and at the end of a meeting like when the boss goes like, "Oh, any questions?" and I and nobody and I don't ask any question, right? And everybody's kind of like, "No, we're good," right? But then usually when I'm like when I do raise my hand and I ask the stupid question, right? Like, this might be a stupid question, but bro, right? Everybody in the room is like, oh, yeah, I had the same question. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> so <laughs> the best podcasts for me are the ones where people ask selfish questions. But anyway, to answer your question, it's like this. I think for that person, it's kind of like, let's say this is the lesson that I want to teach. I've learned this life lesson. And I learned that, you know, this is what you need to do to be a successful artist or whatever it is, then that lesson doesn't mean anything to anyone unless you actually <laughs> became a successful artist, right? If I'm mm -hmm. saying, okay, this is how you get, you can get big clients, right? Like, let's say I say, this is how you can land bigger clients. But let's say I've never had big clients before, right? <laughs> Nobody's going to listen to me because like I, I like, I didn't, I wasn't actually successful for it. Like, so imagine somebody says, this is how you build a rocket, but that person has never built a rocket before. Are you going to believe that person? Right. Mm -hmm. It's, it's kind of like that. Right. But in your story, that's not what you're trying to do. The lesson you're trying to teach is not like, okay, this is how you, we should change our education system. Or that's not what you're saying. Right. What you're saying is, this is how I felt. And therefore, I want to learn how 
I, you know, I don't let the same thing happen for my child. Yeah. Do you understand what I mean? Then it doesn't dismiss what you felt, right? And and everyone who felt that same same way is gonna tune in just to see, like, okay, what what's gonna happen? And so now the only thing you need to prove is by asking the right questions. Mm-hmm. And and I really think that you have to be selfish in those questions. And if you keep asking selfish questions, you're like, oh. For example, let's say you br- you bring in a like a, some an educator, or you bring in a, a a psychiatrist, or whatever whatever different people they are, and you them you ask them selfishly about okay. So I'm I am um you know I, I'm thinking about homeschooling my child, and you know but blah, blah, blah. but I'm really worried about like the social aspect of it, or like what's going to happen if you know like how. Or or some something like that, like whatever you're you're really curious about. Yeah. Then I think that's probably most likely going to be the answer that everybody wants else wants to hear too. Mm. So you're saying that by being selfish, as in by asking questions that are very specific to my own situation, and asking mm. it authentically and openly that the answers will help other people who are experiencing my particular issue, therefore making it more beneficial. Yeah. And more, re- even more relatable. Also, the more specific you are about your own life and your own personal situation, the more relatable it's going to be to other people. Okay. You, you yeah. know how, um, I don't know if you've heard me say this, but, you know, Superbad is the um, most high li- highest gross, grossing high school film of all time, of all time, like meaning even going way back to like Breakfast Club or like even Clueless or Mean Girls, <laughs> like doesn't matter, like what? Superbad is the highest grossing. And if you think about it, like Superbad is a very atypical high school movie, right? Mm. It's not like the 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 typical uh, high school prom queen with the high school nerd, you know, the cheerleader. Like it's it's not the typical high school movie. But you know, Seth Rogen says when they wrote that movie, they they made it very specific to them, where we're just a couple of teenage kids growing up in Canada, yeah. with going through these specific um, situations in their high school. Mm. And that's what they wrote about. But the more specific they were, the more people were resonating with it. Do you understand what I mean? Yeah. So, and it's because when you try to write this like high school prom king movie or the, the, or the captain of the football team or, or the, um, you know, that one movie where this, this girl is like a total nerd, like a loser who becomes like, you know, homecoming queen or something like that. Like when you try to write these Cinderella stories and these like um, fairy tale stories, what happens is 99% of people are not that, right? 99% of us were, we were neither the biggest dorks in school nor the most popular kid in school. We were somewhere in between. Do you understand what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, that's why when you talk about specific situations, it's actually going to be more relatable. Yeah, that's really good. And I have heard you tell that story before, mm-hmm. but it, it it makes a lot of sense um, in my particular situation. And I'm really glad you brought that up uh, because a and lot I know of things for- are clicking for me. Yeah. I, I know it for a fact because I actually talk to I have I'm not a parent, but I do talk to friends and people that I know that are parents. And I, I see this topic of homeschooling coming up a lot. Yeah. Like, oh should should we homeschool kids? Oh I don't want to send them to like a public school. Like should I send them to charter school? And I so you the fact that I, I see this topic come up a lot and people are asking these questions leads me to believe that there's 
whatever questions you have for these experts, a lot of people probably, because as soon as you said that on uh, homeschooling, yeah. like I was actually curious, like what about like what's going to happen with their social skills and things like that? And then you, you brought that up, right? So I, I feel like th- that's where the gold is. <laughs> whatever you're curious about <laughs> for your own child. Yeah. That's what other people are going to be curious about for their child. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, it's really scary, actually, because um, I I generally in just all the time, I have so many questions and I'm always asking questions, but I feel like I always ask really the dumb questions, like the ones that I think nobody wants to know the answer to. And it's only me that is having this question. Um, And so I'm almost scared to amplify on that. Because I think I know what you mean, but I just want to (laughs) confirm. (laughs) Well, I can't think of an example on the spot, um, but I will say... Let me give you an example. Sure. So what you just asked me about that, um, about that, okay, what, what should I do if I'm still going through it? Or like, you know what I mean? If I haven't achieved something, like how can I tell a story? Like to me, the, the dumb questions are usually the follow-up questions. Do you understand what I mean? So for example, like I also told this story these this example before but when when i used to go into a meeting right um and we're selling technology product we're selling like app development or something like that and then there there will be some okay this is a typical tech uh sales meeting so there'll be a some some tech sales person that that's that's talking about oh yeah and then we're going to be using a mvc framework and you know that that's you know that's what like Ruby on Rails and these, like they bring up some popular technologies and that's, you know, this is, that's why this is so popular or something like that. Or like right now, JavaScript is like the hot thing. So they they might bring in something like, oh yeah, we're going to use a JavaScript framework and because it's faster and blah, blah, blah. Hmm. Right. And then everybody in the room is like, oh yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> like the first question for them would, would have been like, oh, what framework are you using and why? And then like, I oh, know where you're going with this, yeah. And, and then everyone was like, okay, yeah, that's good. But then usually the, the CEO that's in the meeting will ask the dumb question. They'll be like, oh, I don't want to sound like I don't want to sound dumb, but why is it better? Exactly. <laughs> or something like that. Yes. One hundred. <laughs> and then now that person is forced to explain it, right? And actually, the reason why CEOs ask that is because they're they're naturally curious because they didn't understand that. They didn't understand it the way a child would understand that. So they they actually want to know. The, it's a selfish thing, right? But then, usually in that scenario, none of the other person that says, oh, I got it, even they had the same question. They just didn't want to sound stupid so that they didn't raise their hand to ask, Right, because if I were to go and ask them, because since you guys didn't have those questions, what's your answer? They still can't answer me. Like I I feel like that's why, like Einstein said, like if you can't teach to a six year old, you don't really know it well yourself. So then, I I was like that. I was that guy. I was that guy in the room that would ask that that stupid question that tech sales people hate, right? Because now he has to explain it to me, and he doesn't know how to, right? But because of that, I actually learned to how to explain these more clearly. So when I was in that meeting, I would actually be like, okay, the way the way an MVC framework works is because MVC stands for model view controller. And then model is where we store all of your company data, meaning all your employees, all the products you sell. And they're all just in its own objects, right? And then that... Within this model, there's already we, we embed all the rules in there already. Mm-hmm. For example, if they buy this with this, they get discount and you know, but whatever that it is, right? And then view is where what you see on screen, 
right? All it is is just like a skeleton of the thing that you see on your screen. Like if you're an e-commerce store, like the list of the products or the checkout page or whatever it is, right? And then controller is where we put in all the, oh, actually, sorry. Model has some basic, um, basic criteria, basic rules, right? Like for example, if you can't buy more than, if one customer can't buy more than 12 or something like that, that's embedded into the model because that, that's a rule that cannot be broken, right? Controller is where like all the other logics happen. So for example, if somebody from the view says, okay, I want to find all the products that are under $50, right? Then view just shows that somebody selects $50 and hits submit and now it goes to the controller and the controller will, will understand what that logic is and then we'll connect to the view uh, model and then the model will take care of all the basic rules so that you, you know that it'll never ignore those business rules. And then it, it, it gets, it comes back to the controller. And, and when you, when you code it like this, as, as your business grows and you add more business logics and things like that, it's going to be hard. It's going to be easier to keep track of things and, you know, less bugs are going to happen. And it's also easier to do development because when, when we just need to change the logic, we just do it here or something like that, right? So, that, like, and then somebody's going to be like, okay, you know, then why can't we do it like this? Blah, blah, blah. Like, <laughs> do you understand what I mean? <laughs> but it, the best questions are usually that the questions that, like, that annoying child asks. But why? But why do we have to do it like that? <laughs> right? <laughs> but usually when you ask that, that's, that's the thing that everybody else was curious about too. They just didn't have the balls to ask it. But see, in my situation, mm -hmm. I always get that look of, weren't you paying attention? Um, or do we really have to go all the way back? And so, like... Well, it's because I think <laughs> it, it, brings, it comes back to your original what you said in the beginning of the show, which is, I think most people are willing, are okay with just accepting that answer that somebody mm. says. And now that's just how it is, right? Yeah. Whereas in like, maybe you and I are different. Like, no, I, I'm not willing to just accept that. What, why is it, okay, <laughs> then why is the thing that you said is like that, like that, <laughs> right? <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. And... Yeah, and and that's and I guess that's kind of what makes us different. And it's it's actually used the reason why I I come up with so many content that set, makes people say I never thought of it that way because usually oh, okay here's a perfect example right I think we talked about um, I talked about how Steve Jobs like when when I, I'm pretty sure I told you this story before but I'll say for the audience. When they built the Macintosh, they think that the real innovation of Macintosh came from the graphical user interface, the mouse, and all of that. But all of that was already built in the previous GUI computer, which was called the Lisa. The only difference was the Lisa was $12,000, and Steve Jobs wanted to make something that's under $2,000, right? So he went through the, the entire manufacturing process, and he saw how it's done. He's like, oh, yeah. So why do we buy all the materials up front? Because, you know, you're, you're saying that, you know, if we buy it now, next year it might get cheaper, and depending on that, we might lose money. Or also, why do we have to do this first, and then before we bring it to here, and then they, why, why can't we just do this part here, or why can't this people, this person just do also do this? Like he asked all these dumb questions, yeah. In the and, and he didn't know anything about manufacturing, and the the answer that he kept getting from the the experts of the manufacturing <laughs> process was like that's just the way it's always been done. Do you understand what I mean? So yeah, the most quo. people, yeah, most people do things just because it's the way it's been done without critically really thinking and asking, why is that the way it's, like, why can't we find a better way to do that or something like that? And that's kind of like how cars were made, right? Like when Tesla first started made cars, every car, they manufactured these standard parts, right? There's a standard parts that every car uses. And there's a manufacturing company that makes those parts. And to you, whether you're Toyota or, you know, like Mercedes or whatever it is, they buy these parts from this one company. And, and these are like the, the screws or certain parts that goes inside the engine, the cylinders or whatever it is. 
they have to use those parts, right? Mm. And then Elon Musk has <laughs> said, why do we have to do that? Like, it's because, it's because, and that's because it's, it's the cheapest way, right? Because mm -hmm. these parts are already made, so we can just use it. But then he thought about it and he's like, no, it's, but because now we're, now we have to pay this another company that to make those parts for us, right. that's going to cost more. And then now we have to spend more money <laughs> assembling those things into this, right? That's how assembly lines work. But so eventually, like, he just kind of stretched that whole thing and he came up with the idea of Gigapress where instead of like assembling those parts, this this kind of machine just <laughs> like goes boom, and then it just prints that. It basically molds that uh, the, the huge frame of the car, right? Mm -hmm. Without having to use little pieces. So something like that. And that's the reason why Tesla is the only electric car manufacturer that has like a $9,000 profit margin where I think every other car has like, you know, a thousand dollar profit margin or something like that right hmm. but that's because he he saw how it's being done and everybody was saying that's just how it's always been done and then he found a better way yeah yeah so elon musk is probably autistic <laughs> well <laughs> right? i think there was talk about maybe potentially asperger's right um but yeah <laughs> Yeah, 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 maybe even more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So, I mean, it's really tricky. And uh, I know that you have to go soon. So I just have one last question. Um, mm -hmm. And just want to squeeze this in there. Uh, so one of the reasons I joined Night Owl Nation was because um, I was in awe of your ability to just, to just express contrarian views um, without any kind of fear. And I was wondering, I well, I wanted to reverse engineer that. And I'm just trying, like, if you could just have, like, one piece of advice, like, the very next step for me specifically um, into getting to that place of being comfortable, of, you know, disagreeing with people or saying the unpopular thing or asking the dumb question, like, what would that be? Mm-hmm. So I think, I think that because I was exactly like, I wasn't always this way, right? I, mm -hmm. I wasn't like in the in those meetings. I I would never speak up, right? And what had to happen was, I think in the beginning I kind of had to be dumb, <laughs> and and even now I I like I. I approach it as like oh, I'm I'm just I'm I'm the dumb guy. Just humor me, please, <laughs> and answer me this question because I don't know, right? Mm -hmm. So I kind of approach it approach everything that way. Um, and and then like I, I whenever I say some stupid idea, because like you know, there's certain percentage of what everything I say that is actually dumb, right? That makes no sense. And I have, I have to be very willing to admit that. I'm like, oh, yeah, that was stupid. <laughs> but it's okay because I'm dumb. <laughs> Do you understand what I mean? Yeah. So, so you're owning that per persona. Exactly. So, but for me, how it started, it was when I started asking that question. Yes, in the beginning, I was afraid to raise my hand and ask that question. Or I was in a meeting, I'm, I was afraid to say this thing. But it, it's like, um, you know, I think confidence comes from, I guess not confidence, but I, I don't know if confidence is the right word, but confidence comes from like a series of affirmation of something, right? Mm. So what happens is in the beginning, it's, it is scary, let's say, but then when you do it like 20 times, right? When you ask those questions 20 times, and then let's say 15 out of those 20 times, you were actually surprised that actually they... <laughs> they really like the question or it turned out positive. And then five times it's, it's like, Oh, what, you know, that's a stupid question, Ray, or something like that. <laughs> then because more, more so than not positive outcome came out of that, you're going to feel more confident to ask that question the next time. And again, mm -hmm. and again, and the more it happens, like, let's say you did it a hundred times, a thousand times. And you see that, okay, actually most people like this question. Then it becomes an easier and easier and easier for you to do it, right? So, 
Yeah, I think it's just pure numbers. And what I think what you're going to find is that whenever you you say the thing that you're afraid to say, or you, but that you're really curious about, hmm. and you just say it and you ask it, what you're going to find is almost everybody else in the room had the same thought as you. They they just didn't want to. They were just scared to say it. Okay. <laughs> I will. I will keep doing that to myself. Yeah. Uh, it's very hard, but I will keep trying. And if it doesn't go well, <laughs> I know to blame. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so yeah, much, and blame me. I always say, tell people, just blame me. I'll take all the blame because I'm I'm just a dumbass who, <laughs> like, I and I I always tell, tell tell people that too because I don't. I'm not like a. I mean, I do research things that I'm very curious about. I'm not, but I'm not an academic person, right? So I'm, I'm constantly reiterating the fact that, hey, these are all things based on my personal experience. That none of them are science. None of, none of them are research, <laughs> like research from a research paper or anything like that, right? And finally, I'm, I'll say this in terms of your story. Hmm. So the way I would tell your story or when you introduce your podcast or, or your content is exactly how you told a story, right? Is growing up, this is how you felt. Hmm. And I don't want my own child to go through this, right? I want, I want, my, ch- I want my child to have the opposite experience of what I had. But I, I don't know how to do that in this environment of the so the same old system, right? So I want to I want to find an answer, I, and I want to you know I want to talk to experts. I want to talk to experts in different areas, and people have different opinions. And I want to just through this conversation, I want to ask, and I want to try to figure out what what. So it, it, it's almost like you're being selfish, right? I, I'm mm-hmm. I'm trying to learn this for my own child, right? And then. And then you're kind of reporting back, oh, yeah, so we sent her to this school and what we found is this, right? And the, But the downside was this or whatever. Whatever you're... Ex- ex- so you're, it's almost like you're documenting your journey oh, yeah. of being a parent who, who doesn't want to their child to go through the same thing that you went through. And through, through you documenting your journey, other people are going to learn from it. Something like that. Right. And then in the process of documenting my journey as a parent, I'm also revealing my own personal stories of why this is important. Exactly. Um, Okay. This is very helpful. And I think if the one thing that I'm going to take away, at least tonight, uh, before I sleep on everything that you shared with me, is to be more selfish um, with what I'm curious about. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) <laughs> definitely, definitely be selfish. Because I, I, I that when you're more selfish, that's what everybody wants to know. Because everybody was selfish about that same thing too, but nobody was selfish enough to ask it. And and I think what would happen is, yes, you will attract other parents who are curious about those same selfish questions that you have for for their own selfish reasons, like for their child. So two things. So. They're going to relate more because they, they're, you're going to attract these parents, right? Who are mm-hmm. trying to raise their children. But in doing so, you're going to attract other people mm-hmm. who are not parents, but who went through the similar experience that you did just because they want to know. And you're going to, so when you're like, people think that when, oh, if I just talk about like parenting and how education for my child, that, that I'm only going to attract parents, but that's not true at all, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you're going to attract a lot of other people too. Uh, and the second thing is, this is why I love people who ask selfish questions and people who are doing for selfish reasons. Because at the end of the day, we're already we're all selfish anyway. Mm. So I don't I, I trust you more if you are being selfish. Mm. But if you're pretending to be selfless, like I'm doing this for the world, like subconsciously, people are already going to trust you less. Mm. Do you understand what I mean? 100%. Like, I, I rather pe- people, I rather know their intentions. Like, oh, oh, she's asking that self, 
truly because she cares about that answer for her own child or her, her own curiosity or whatever it is. So I know that I, that's authentic. <laughs> Do you, something like that, you know what I mean? Yeah, that is so true. Gosh, son, you've gave, <laughs> you've given me so many nuggets uh, to think about and to apply. Um, you know the third step of Bloom's taxonomy, um, and I am looking forward to this very scary journey. Uh, but I yeah. really appreciate your advice. I feel like I would definitely. If you ask those selfish questions, selfish questions, I feel like I would definitely listen to that because now you're starting to make me wonder, like if where I, where I fit in that, you know, top top bottom thinking versus uh, in a bottom up thinking or something like that. So I'm curious yeah. now. <laughs> yeah, you should go explore that, son. Yeah. I feel like um, we share certain brain traits. Um, you might want to look into. So maybe if. We, if I follow your podcast, I'll get I'll get the answers. <laughs> I don't know. The first uh, seventeen conversations are just me like uh, trying to figure out what I'm doing with the podcast. So um, we'll see. <laughs> but I'll definitely. Oh, so it wasn't you know. an interview. It was not an interview style. It was. It was interviews. Oh, okay, I had okay. conversations with um, I think about seventeen people so far, um, and. I was just trying to figure out where I'm going with the podcast, but I'm slowly starting to understand why I started the podcast and it is related to um, everything that I shared in my story. So awesome. uh, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm gearing up. I'm for glad you're two. there. <laughs> and then <laughs> yeah, so let much. me know if you want to, if you want me to come I on would love for you to be on my podcast, but I'm so scared to take more of your time because you are a very busy person. So um, uh, I'm I'll happy be sending to, you like an email. I, yeah. <laughs> um, like, I, like we said when we first started that exercise, like yeah. I'll, I'll go on. Anyone who starts a podcast in the last 20 episodes, I'll go on your podcast. So Awesome. <laughs> well, okay. I look forward to having you. A sequel. <laughs> Thanks for coming on, Ray. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Thanks, and I'll see you all next week. Cheers. Bye.